What is your stance on the congressional term limit? Uh, I actually do believe there should be congressional term limits, and I am going to, whether or not they are in place, self-term limit at 12 years. Uh, I actually believe that for anybody who wants to stay involved in politics, there are plenty of other offices you can run for. So if you've been a congressman, you know, for, you know, there are congressmen who are great who have been there for more than 12 years. They should be forced to say, run for something else. Run for senator, run for governor. If you want to stay in politics, you have to run for something else, not stay in the same seat for 40 years. What would be your stance on earmarks? Uh, I don't believe there should be earmarks, especially ones that are in secret. Um, it, it all goes to your definition of earmarks. If an earmark is something that is slipped into the bill in the middle of the night without a public hearing, without anybody except the politician saying, we're going to spend money on uh, a bridge at Shelton, then I'm against it. What I'm for is actually saying, geez, if we want transportation funding, let's put together a pool of money that's for transportation and then actually have bids submitted from the states to actually say, we would like to have uh, a piece of that money and actually have people evaluate those bids that aren't politicians, actually have engineers and people to say, geez, you know, the, the bridge uh, over the uh, Housatonic, uh, the Moses Wheeler Bridge needs repair, and that's more important than a bridge in Alabama. We actually should have that form of funding mechanism, not this in the middle of the night, let's slip an earmark in because I happen to be a powerful politician. Would you vote for a bill that was unpopular with your constituents? Uh, yes, and in fact, I already have, um, as I voted on several occasions uh, up in uh, Hartford for bills that you know most people would look at and say, "Geez, I, I, I don't support that." Um, you know, one area has been in the area of health care mandates, uh, where the state basically says, uh, for example, every single person in Connecticut needs to be covered for prostate exams. Well, if you're a single woman, you don't need to be covered for prostate exams. Now, that's something that if you went out to the general public and said, geez, should everybody be covered for prostate exams, everybody would say, yes, the insurance company should cover that. But it escalates the cost of health care to say that single women need to pay an extra 3 or $4 a month to actually have this in their health care. You know, we'll talk more about health care later on, but that's the problem that we're having today with health care is governments getting involved in inflating the costs. So I voted consistently against those health care mandates, uh, which I'm sure if you poll people would not be popular. What role do you believe the federal government should play in education? You, you know, a very small one. Uh, it's something that is uh, mostly kind of relegated to the states. Um, it is something that under the Tenth Amendment is a state's issue. Um, you know, the role of the federal government should be one of a clearinghouse should be one that actually helps facilitate best practices between the states because there might be something that they're doing out in Kansas that would work very, very well here in Connecticut. What's not the role of the federal government is to come in and micromanage and to tie that to funding. Right? What has happened over the course of the last 30 years is the government has spent more and more of our federal tax dollars on education and because of that, with things like No Child Left Behind, which well intended, but has been a nightmare in its implementation, um, have actually harmed education. So it's something that I would want to see primarily left to the states and the federal government as a clearinghouse of ideas to help the best ideas bubble to the top of the ship. Five, Linda? Five, five, five. Would you have voted for TAR for any of the stimulus packages? Uh, I'll take those one at a time, and I'll take the second one first. The stimulus package, no. Uh, and I actually believe that we, and I've proposed publicly, that we repeal the 80% of the stimulus package that has not been spent, and actually instead give a payroll tax cut. Because the stimulus is full of pork barrel spending that's not helping middle class families. For a lot less money, we'll actually reduce the deficit and be able to stimulate the economy if we cut the payroll tax for one year from 6% to 3% that put $1,500 in every middle class family's pocket and give small businesses money to hire more people. And it's going to result in about $200 billion less in the federal deficit. Um, on TARP, not the way it was structured. The way TARP was structured, it basically said, banks, here you go. Here's a whole bunch of money. Please don't go bankrupt. And, you, and, and people do say out there, well, it might have been a lot worse without it. But it wasn't the right answer. The right answer to actually help the financial system would have been two things. One is to say, look, retrospectively, you have a lot of bad assets on your books. 
they actually had a program that they proposed, but never really went through, called the PPIP, the Private Public Investment Partnership, that would have gotten private investment to take those toxic assets off the bank's books for pennies on the dollar, so the banks would take a loss on them, and then they would unravel them in this other, they called it a bad bank, right, separately. A much, much better idea than just giving the banks money and saying, please don't go bankrupt. Um, but going forward, what we need to do to make sure this doesn't happen again is we actually need simple regulation, not like what Chris Dodd has proposed, which would be a big government bureaucracy. But banks should be forced to mark to market, which means that every year, if you have something on your books, you need to know what that's worth. If you can't tell us the value of it, then you're not allowed to do it. Because regulation, the best regulation is simple. It's not a government bureaucracy. So those are the types of things that we need to do to make sure that things like the banking crisis don't happen again not massive bailouts and, and more government bureaucracy. Speaking of regulation, would you be in favor of restoring Glass-Steagall? You know, it's actually something that you, this is the first question that I'm going to give a, a, a happy answer on. Because um, it's something that I think, in retrospect, it looks like it makes sense. Um, but you would hope that banks would have the self-discipline not to put depositors' money at risk through you know, complex investment banking activities. Uh, the, 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 you know, if you asked me that question five years ago, I would have said no. Uh, today, I'm rethinking that position. Um, and honestly, I haven't made up my 